Uh, so I'm John Goble, and I'm a, a visiting artist here at uh, Art Space for three weeks. I got here. Uh, when did I get here? February 1st, I think. I'm on sabbatical. Um, I teach at the University of Hawaii at Hilo, but I, I don't even I don't even know what the day is. I don't know what date it is. I uh, I've been <laughs> cooked up upstairs for for two weeks already working on a project. So I'll get to that. I actually brought it with me so you guys can see. Um, but uh, yeah, I've been busy, and I'm glad that I, I connected with Laura. So this is a great place, very cool, um, fantastic facility upstairs, and so much potential. So um, yeah, I wish I wish she was here so I could thank her. But, um, so, anyways, I grew up in Evansville, Indiana, and uh, so I was a, a corn-fed boy. Uh, in fact, there used to be a corn uh, a cornfield at the end of our dead-end street. And uh, so for the first half of my life, you know, growing up in the Midwest in a small town, had never been in a plane, uh, I'd never been to the ocean, never been to the beach. I felt very, you know, isolated, landlocked. Uh, these seemingly small things, you know, kind of, they, they weighed me down a bit. You know, I, they, they seemed really intriguing. I wanted to do them, but kind of out of grasp. So um, to me, I think that's the impetus of what, you know, pushed me later in life to to get out there and you know go to other countries, travel a lot, um, and not be afraid to move. I've moved a lot. In fact, <clears throat> this is the the lecture that I'm going to give to my alma mater for my bachelor's degree, University of Southern Indiana. Uh, I'm going to jury their 50th annual student show, and uh, they wanted to hear, you know, how did you end up in Hawaii from uh, Evansville, Indiana? So it, uh, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Um, so that's kind of what, what we're in store for today. Uh, I made a lot of things as a kid growing up. What a handsome kid, right? Uh, I spent a lot of time, uh, you know, just in the basement putting things together. That's my ray gun for, you know, World War III or <laughs> aliens or whatever, you know. Spark plug and a battery. It's, if the battery was good, it probably would have caught on fire. Um, uh, so I, I, I did, I did cabinetry, I did woodworking, I, I did art, I did pastels, you know, this is all in high school and stuff. Uh, but when it came, it, it came time to choose a major, you know, I, I kind of wanted to, to go down the practical road. Uh, art was not really something I thought I would pursue, so um, I had a full ride for engineering. And I thought it was an engineering degree. Turns out it was an engineering tech degree. I still don't know the difference, but uh, yeah, I chose engineering. Uh, I had a, a scholarship, a couple of grants. I was actually making money to go to school. It was a pretty sweet deal, um, but I hated it. <laughs> I hated it. I hated the people. I hated the students. I hated the content. It was really boring. It wasn't creative, and I wanted to make stuff because that's what I had always done. I, making stuff is fun, and I I, I was being advised uh, by my advisor for the second semester there. I was like, I want to take a printmaking class. No. What? No, you can't do that. Why? Well, you're on a scholarship, and this is what you're going to take, because you need to graduate in four years. I was like, oh, really? Hmm. OK. Um, I'm, I'm out. <laughs> then he stood up and yelled at me. Like, oh my god, dude, chill out. I'm just going to go be an art major. <laughs> That's cool. So. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's true what they say, you got to follow your passion, um, you know, follow it, eventually you'll, you'll get where you need to be, right? And, um, but if your passion's, you know, playing Fortnite in your mom's basement, then, you know, just ignore what I just said, okay? Uh, uh, so fast forward four years, uh, I'm an art major, and yes, I'm graduating. This is the first uh, color etching I ever made in my whole life. I think it was uh, 2000. Yeah. So, uh... I made that amidst the chaos of preparing for grad school, getting married, uh, getting ready to move a thousand miles away to grad school, uh, away from everything I ever knew. Uh, so this piece is inspired by decisions and vulnerability and weird little creatures. <laughs> uh, we always had artwork hanging in the, in the studio, so uh, we had uh, David Dreisbach and Warrington Cole Scott's hanging up, and, and this sort of inspired me visually. And, conceptually. For those in the audience who aren't familiar with printmaking, uh, and I imagine there's a few, uh, in a nutshell, 
basically we're creating a matrix. You can see the different types here. Uh, relief is a, probably the simplest. I mean, you can even do relief with your hands. Most of us have probably done that as kids. You just dip your hands in ink and you put them on paper and you're done, right? Yeah, that's pretty simple. Um, but you can carve a piece of wood and uh, roll up whatever's left and then run it through a press or print it by hand. Uh, intaglio, which is the opposite of relief, where you're carving away or etching away at lines or textures, and then you put the ink in those crevices, and you need to press to get that back out. So you have to run it through a press with a lot of pressure. So lithography is the devil. Um, it's evil, horrible. Uh, no, actually, lithography is, is what produces your um, your magazines, your posters, it's a very commercial way to uh, reproduce something in large quantities very accurately. But it's also a fine art medium. So basically it's a water stencil, um, and you roll your, your greasy ink over it, and wherever there's uh, not water, the ink is going to stick. This is pretty, pretty straightforward, but it never works like that. I have a little bit of a grudge against it. Um, yeah. So screen printing, and I know they do a lot of screen printing here. Uh, basically, it's a silk screen or a monofilament polyester, uh, which is what they make fishing line out of. And uh, you can block out part of that area and then just squeegee ink right through. It's pretty simple, it's, it's uh, non-toxic, and uh, it's pretty straightforward. But surprisingly hard to teach, I'm not sure why. I've never seen such messes. Uh, I went off to grad school, Texas Tech is where I went. Um, uh, you don't have to go to grad school, but you know, I think it was good you know, for me just to spend a few years uh, making artwork after my bachelor's. Because you're, you're you know, in college and you're just kind of trying to appease your professors and just make stuff and get through it and you know, not get bad grades. Uh, but you really can't focus on like, a series of work to really find yourself. At least I couldn't. Um, so <laughs> teaching at grad school. So I wanted to go to grad school that, that had a, a a teaching stipend so that I could um, get a tuition break. I basically went to grad school for free. Um, so I had to either be a lab tech or I had to teach classes. And I'd never taught, so uh, my, I was an assistant, a teaching assistant with one lady and she was great. Um, and then they gave me my own drawing class. I was like, that's awesome. Uh, what time is it? It's just seven in the morning. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, all right, all right. I'm not a morning person. <laughs> it's really hard the past few days to get up and print because uh, I got help coming early. But uh, 7 a.m. is a bad time to teach drawing to anybody. Uh, and I had uh, about 20, I think I had 22 students in the class. Uh, 20 of them were uh, sorority girls. They didn't want to be there. So I, I was really broken in for just about. Anything that could be thrown at me. And it, it, I think it made me a better person, but it made me want to just to leave, just to get away and never, ever, ever teach again. Uh, while I graduated at TTU, uh, I did a lot of screen printing. Uh, you can see the stencils for my finished piece. This is titled Ass Flower, and it's one of my more tasteful pieces. Uh, and, but graduation, you know, meant it was time to move on. <laughs> I didn't show you the good stuff. Uh, <laughs> so I, I was graduating, right? Um, and I, I, you know, Texas is a cool place, but I did not like Lubbock so much. I was ready to move, and it looked good in the rearview mirror. Uh, so here's what I did. I, I knew I wanted to live by the water. The first time I went to the ocean was with my uh, fiance, now wife, of almost 20 years. And we went to Florida, of course, why not? Uh, and I was like, ocean! This is awesome! How would you not want to live here? So, <laughs> I wanted to go to the, live on the east coast somewhere. I don't know why east versus west. My dad always told me the west coast is too expensive. I don't know, he never lived on the west coast, I don't know. Uh, so, <laughs> I had this plan to get a job, and my plan was to lie. A lot. So that's what I did. I emailed every single school on the east coast, from New York to Miami, if it was 50 miles from the coast, I mean, this is hundreds and hundreds of colleges and universities. <laughs> I found the art department, I found the department chair, email, and I told him, I'm moving to your city. <laughs> I'm moving to Orlando, Winston-Salem, Belmar, Savannah, blah, 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 all the way down. And 
that was kind of fun, you know, because, you know, if I found something that sounded interesting, I, was, I would just totally move. Why not? I was teaching online, so I could move wherever I wanted. That online thing is, is pretty shady. I'm not going to bring that up again. Um, so surprisingly enough, I had several uh, opportunities to open up. So um, the best one, though, uh, remember that email to Belmar, New Jersey? So I ended up teaching at this really cool place. They actually filmed Annie at this place. You guys know that Little Orphan Annie movie? Uh, Mom of the University, which is in West Long Branch, New Jersey. Beautiful place. You think New Jersey is like gross and no, it's, it, parts of it are, but uh, this was a really, uh, this place was all diamond money. It was, <laughs> it was pretty nice, expensive. Uh, so I got an adjunct position teaching printmaking and foundation courses. So. Um, I said yes over the phone, like, yeah, I'm moving there, uh, I'll see you soon. <laughs> so, uh, it just happened that I got into this jury show in New York, in Chelsea, um, Robert Rosenblum, who's the curator of the Guggenheim for drawing. I was like, oh shit, this guy's like, this is big, I need to go to New York. And my friend, who was my studio mate in grad school, he got in the show too. We both got in the same show. We both went to the same grad school. We both went to the same undergrad school. How weird is this? Just now made that connection. Um, anyways, so we drove from Texas to uh, New York. And I thought, hey, we'll just stop through New Jersey on the way. And I'd be like, yeah, I'm really moving here. I'm coming. <laughs> See? And I did. I went there and I met them. And uh, they were like, we like you. We're going to hire you. And by the way, we have an administrative appointment for you. It's $25,000 a year. Really? Uh, let me think. Yeah, OK, got it. So I said, yes. And I was like, all right, we're set. It's $25,000 a year, right? That's so much money <laughs> in New Jersey, right? Uh-huh. That's, that's not a lot of money. So um, anyway, I worked there for several years. I think it was four or five years. Uh, it was a great place to work. It's a private university, so they had money because they charged $20,000 a semester or a year. I don't even know. But they had money. And it was like, I need to do this. They said yes. It was pretty interesting. Because um, that's not how it usually works. New Jersey was a cool place. Um, when we first moved there, have you guys seen the Jersey Shore or heard of the Jersey Shore? The show? It's just awful. That's, that's real. We lived in that, in Belmore. DJs, where they shot the thing, was a block away from our house. Wow. Okay, anyway. So uh, we could walk to the beach in 10 minutes. We're 40 minutes outside New York. Uh, which is, you know, it's a huge cultural melting pot. Um, but New Jersey was where I was introduced to the Southern Graphics Council Conference, uh, which I had heard of, but I had never gone to it. So it just so happened that in 2004, 20, 2004 that's the year, um, they held it at Rutgers, which is uh, in Newark, which is literally the armpit of the country. Um, don't ever fly through there if you can, just stay away. So SGC is the largest print organization in North America. Um, thousands of people go to these conferences. Uh, you got exhibits, panels, demos, um, presentations. I've been deeply involved with this organization for, well, since 2004. Um, and it's just a great way to make connections to professionals, um, either students or um, you know, artists, anybody can connect with people there. Uh, and it was a big eye-opener, you know. I think for me it was, um, they have this session you can see on the far left here, all those people in there have tables. You can do an open portfolio, you just bring your work and you lay it out. And hundreds, maybe even thousands of people, they come by and they're like, no, 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 hey, that's pretty interesting. And they'll come and talk to you. And so I bring my students to that now. I'm like, be brave and stand up and make eye contact and you might make connections. And you know what, it really works. And so I've been involved in so many shows and exchange portfolios and opportunities because of this conference. And you can just geek out, it's a lot of fun. Uh, so I made a lot of Italia work in New Jersey because I had to make so much screen printing stuff in Texas, I was just done with it. I have not made a single screen print since grad school. And I really wanted to focus on that, and they didn't do that. And that's on me, I knew that. 
but most of the works that this series um, involved uh, social etiquette, or the lack thereof, I guess. But uh, this is the delicious spaghetti dinner. This is 2006. <laughs> Uh, this is a large etching, you know, the, the plate was this big, the paper is pretty big. Uh, and this is the first piece I made that, that actually won a lot of awards. And I'm like, wow, that's very um, um, confirming that you're doing something. Willie Cole, who's a sculptor in New Jersey, gave me an award for that piece. Uh, it was shown at the Monmouth Museum. Um, and I don't know if you guys remember Willie Cole or not, but uh, he was famous for those scorch drawings he did with irons in the 80s. And so, uh, he's still like super popular. Uh, anyways, he circles back around in my life a few more times, which is quite interesting, so I'll get to that. Uh, and those I worked with also influenced me. These are two of the gentlemen that I worked with, and I use that term very loosely. Uh, every, not every day, but several times a week, I found myself, while I was supposed to be working at uh, Otto's, the bar down the street, eating popcorn and drinking beer with these guys. Um, and I show this not just for laughs, but uh, also to provide you guys some context to the growth of my work and how things change over time. So, yeah, this is still around 2006. Um, and you can see my early works are rich with uh, taste and sophistication there. Uh, I, I say that with a little sarcasm, but this all came from an honest place for me. Uh, I loved it in New Jersey, um, but I had originally set my sights on, you know, teaching and sharing and, and engaging students. And you know, teaching a class or two a semester as an adjunct was great. The administrative stuff was like filing MSDS sheets, putting labels on things, and then like, this is so boring. Hey guys, you wanna go to autos? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I felt like after four years there, my, my professional clock was ticking. Like if I gotta get into that, that gig and be a professor, I gotta, I gotta send out some more applications. But this time I was a little more honest. Um, and I <laughs> sent out some applications, but New Jersey was expensive. We bought a house. It was 2006. I was sending out all these applications. I'm like, you watch it, man. This, this economy is going to tank. These houses, we better sell. We better sell. My God, I'm glad we did. Uh, so we just had a kid. I had student loans, mortgage, car loans. Like, we need to get mm, out. We're getting out of here. I hope I find a job somewhere else. So I sent out applications all south of New Jersey and along the East Coast. So I wanted to stay on the East Coast. But this time I had a resume, so I didn't have to lie. I did a small university in Beaufort, South Carolina, and they offered me my first tenure track job. They needed somebody to, uh, Beaufort, by the way, is one of the only cities in the South that survived the Civil War. So all of the structures there are, are still intact. It's a pretty amazing place. Um, but they needed somebody to come in and uh, take the reins on developing a studio art major program. So I was like, yeah, I'm your guy. I can do that. Maybe I lied a little bit. Um, so I, I jumped in and I hit the ground running. Uh, in my seven years there, I created a Bachelor of Arts <coughs> program uh, and I helped transform this small campus downtown. And I had another campus uh, uptown uh, into a thriving arts campus with help. But we made that happen. Um, it, it was a little bit hard to leave, but. Um, since that campus was 25 miles from my home, uh, which is actually in another city, uh, and we lived there because the school district thing, you, when you get kids, you gotta think about that kind of stuff, right? Uh, so I renovated my garage, I had a press, I accept all this free stuff from New Jersey, it was amazing. Um, so having 24 hour access to my studio at home gave me a, a whole different perspective on art making. Uh, so I, I started developing much more complex projects. I actually have this piece on the table, maybe you saw it. Um, I started working with multiple plates and um, basically you wipe color into each different plate. And I have another slide coming up that shows you that, but it takes a long time. Uh, this is Wolf Attire, this was done in 2007. And you know, for me at the time, um, this seemed like kind of Southern. So everywhere I move, you kind of soak up where, where you're at. The idea here, uh, wearing a living wolf, is, is a little bit, you know, ridiculous if you think about it. But um, to me, it was a kind of compelling image um, when you think about these pig nose masks. And I took a lot of heat from this. Like you, you're sexist. You like women. I'm like no, dude, the women won. Look, she's wearing the wolf. So I, I think about like um, uh, the three little pigs and the big bad wolf, but also like uh, Little Red Riding Hood. 
right, where the, the wolf, you know, tricks the little red riding hood and is wearing the grandma or dressed up like the grandma. There's a lot of, you know, grim sort of uh, details in that. But so I, I made a piece kind of based on that um, with the southern flair, you know, the hat, the picket fence, the flowers, the cantaloupes. Yeah. Um, anyhow, uh, a lot of my projects are done for uh, themed artist exchange portfolios. And uh, so people ask you, um, do you want to be in our exchange portfolio? And sometimes they say yes. Um, and so they give you a theme. Um, and maybe invite other artists, 30 other artists, let's say. So each artist would make 30 prints, the same, send them all to the organizer. The organizer collates everything and sends the portfolio back to you. So you get one of yours back and 29 other people's artworks. It's a great way to get your work out there, but it's also a great way to build your collection. I have so many prints, it's insane. I've done like at least 20 of these things. Uh, Lady with Teas, this is done for the history of the United States portfolio. I think it was around 2011. Uh, I was given the year 1873, and um, there was a lot of boring things that happened that year. Uh, <laughs> but the only thing that stood out to me was that uh, there was a similar situation happening then that was happening uh, at the time, 2000, this is 2008 actually, uh, this economic downturn, the Great Panic of 1873, uh, where they invested too much money in railroad building after the Civil War. So. Um, there was a, a bust, you know, um, kind of like what we have with the housing market. And I think about the phrase, my cup runneth over here, um, and what that can mean from a consumption standpoint or economically. So, you know, this, this, she doesn't even know it's, it's cracking, you know, it's just it's starting to crack. It's so full. You're like, ha, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's not so glorious when it just all falls out. Uh, this is the, the slide I was talking about. Um, this is a demo I did at East Carolina University for the Survey of Contemporary Printmaking Symposium in 2010. Um, so this shows you how the process is done in terms of how the colors actually mix. And so um, I think you all saw the plates already, so um, I'll print the yellow plate first, and then I'll print the on that paper, and then I'll print the red plate on top of that, and I'll print the blue plate on top of that, and then finally the key plate, which has most of the contrast. Uh, and the darkest ink, usually it's sort of a really rich brownish black color. Um, and I had this piece accepted into the China Print Festival in 2011, which turned out um, to be an invitational uh, situation to go to China. So I was invited with a handful of other printmakers to uh, travel there, and uh, you know, people from all over the world. Um, so I traveled to, it's the Sichuan province in China, the spicy, the spicy place. Uh, so I went to Chongqing to demonstrate my multiple plate printing process, and uh, wow, there was a lot of people in there, and a different sense of personal space. <laughs> it was pretty cool, there was a lot of energy, but they had no idea what I was saying. Uh, I was there, there was at least 100, 150 people in there, and they were literally, I'm not making this up, they were putting chairs on top of tables, and then standing on top of the chairs. <laughs> and I was nervous, man. Um, so, anyways, they didn't have any idea what I was saying. They just kept talking, and they were nodding, and they were talking, and I was nodding. It was pretty awesome. Uh, <laughs> good times. Also at the festival, I met this guy, Francisco Zotto, who's a Venezuelan printmaker, uh, teaching at the University of uh, Nebraska in Lincoln. And uh, he's doing these innovative things with uh, mezzotints, which is another intaglio process, uh, but digital printing as well. So I spent some time after that kind of um, mixing that with my intaglio work and my etchings and it was super cool to share what he knew and and he was like wow you're doing good things with this you know uh, i did a lot of things at uscb in south carolina i traveled a lot i did a whole bunch of shows i created a major but after seven years of running the department as junior faculty um, and i taught over the summer too I, I just i completely burned myself i was i, I gotta get out of here somebody new let's find somebody new and I'm, I just want to go somewhere else. It, it didn't have to be any place in particular. Um, but I figured they'd be better off with somebody. I'm good at starting things. I can say that. Um, so I, um, I saw this, this listing in 2010 for a job at University of Hawaii in Hilo. And I put my application together, and, and um, I was like, no way, I just I threw it away. I was like, I'm not moving away, that's stupid. 
I was gonna move to Hawaii. I got like a house, I own a house, a car, a kid, and he's in school, and my wife, and like, that's just too much work. Oh, they canceled the search. Probably because I didn't apply. But uh, uh, they relisted it in 2012. I was like, yes, I'm applying. This is perfect timing. So uh, I went there for an interview and I nailed it. And, uh, and then I moved there, which was really interesting uh, to send what you own in one small container the size of a half bath. You get rid of everything else. Um, anyways, uh, I moved there to teach at UH Hilo Art Department. And um, I was drawn there because of this uh, visual and cultural landscape, very different than anything I had ever seen. And I went there on an interview in April uh, of 2013, I guess it was, and I had no expectations. I'd never been to Hawaii. I had no idea what I was getting into. And when I was flying out, I looked down and I almost had a tear in my eyes, like, I want to come back. <laughs> so um, the draw was that, um, that cultural landscape, but as well as serving as director for the Pacific States Biennial uh, Series exhibitions and the potential for a pay raise. <laughs> Seven years without a pay raise. Kind of wears on your soul, man. Kind of what's... <laughs> Look how much younger I was in 2010. Look at that. Jeez. It's so wrong. I got a pay raise, by the way. That's good. Uh, the Big Island is where I live. That's where Hilo is. It is literally the biggest island. You can put all of the other islands in that island. Um, and it's only 300,000 years old. If you think geologically, that is, that's not even an infant. That's just boop, an idea <laughs> of a baby. Um, and then Kauai, which is where I was um, just a couple weeks ago, a few, three or four weeks ago, uh, to make this uh, monoprint series that's on the table, the bigger pieces, is four million years old. So the Pacific plate is just moving over a hot spot, but it obviously doesn't move very fast. So you get all these islands that's just kind of popping up as it moves over that hot spot. So there's always a lot of geological things happening, which I thought kind of scary, but also kind of sexy. <laughs> One of the things I noticed when I moved there was the night sky. I've never seen anything like this because it has very little light pollution. I mean, think about it. You look out and there's no states around you. It's just open ocean for 2,500 miles. Um, so the light from stars, that I learned this because I was like, wow, I want to know more about stars. So I did some research and um, it can take hundreds of thousands of light years for the starlight to actually reach your eyeballs. And so what that means is a lot of the stars you're looking at uh, maybe don't even exist. They haven't existed for a really long time. And you're like, look at the stars! It's not even there. Uh, the notion that our sensory, sense, our sensory experience can be misleading is, is kind of intriguing to me. You know, because, I mean, what do they say? You're supposed to believe what you can see, you know? I'll see it when, I believe it when I can see it, right? No. Uh, so, I'm in a new place. It's time for a new series. I started focusing more on perceptions and how these can be altered or fooled, uh, especially as they relate to space and time and location, since I'm in a new location. Uh, this is pursuit of latitude and explores how perceptions maybe are not exactly what you think they are. Um, we have a suspended pendulous object that you can see there, plumb bob, pendulum, whatever you want to call it, and the death's head hawk moth. So think about these ingredients, okay? Just uh, think about those two things, because I'm going to talk about them a little bit more. Uh, maybe some of you have seen this in a museum, or some public place, the Foucault pendulum, which challenges your perception of movement. So basically, this giant ball on a string you see there um, is suspended from a, a frictionless point, and it's set to swing back and forth. Uh, over time, it appears to change its course, like a clock, you know, a clock goes around in a circle. And so uh, you're like, wow, how does that happen? Why is it moving in that kind of way? And it's actually not moving at all. It's just going back and forth. So what's happening is the earth is rotating around it. All right, that's like, what? <laughs> so that's a good example of how your perceptions can be sort of fooled. And what you're seeing is not actually what is true. And that just kind of really got in my head. Um, 
Acherantia atropos is the death's head hawk moth. It is a really talented little creature there. Um, it has the ability to cloak itself with honeybee pheromones and go into a beehive and feed on the honey. They're actually considered a pest. Uh, this is a hybrid digital intaglio piece. The moth itself is a digital component. Um, and I titled this atropos appropriately. And there's an uh, actual death's head hawk moth there, so you can get a sense of scale. And you know, it seems amazing to me that these, these things kind of change into, um, they evolve into, the, they look like a honeybee, right? They get the stripes and everything on them. And they have these pheromones. I mean, how does that happen? That's just, that's just weird. <laughs> it just doesn't seem possible. Uh, so 2015, I was invited to participate in a portfolio called Distortion. Where basically, you know, you make a piece about distorted viewpoints and that sort of thing. Uh, this was for Knoxville and the uh, SGCI conference, 2015. Okay. Uh, so this piece I titled Interloper. Um, I continued exploring that idea of cloaking or disguise in a more literal sense. So I went out to the local uh, Grow Your Own Pot store, and I got some of the uh, Mylar reflective stuff, and I <laughs> tried cutting this out by hand, and I was like, sad, sad attempt. So I had won some award at a makery, and they had a laser cutter. I'm like, ooh, let's go there. So I took my little vector file over there, and I cut about 200 of these things in 10 minutes. Oh, so I turned them all into little stickers, and I, I made uh, this, this whole edition of prints. So you can see kind of like a honeycomb uh, situation happening in the background. That reflection that you see in there, that's actually me trying to take a picture of this. And so the, you hold the print and it's flexing back and forth and it's distorting you as you're the interloper, as you're looking at it. So I thought it was a pretty clever solution to the project. Um, so you see yourself as the moth. Um, my interest in moths it stems from their transformation because, you know, they go from the little funky little caterpillars into their cocoons and turn into butterflies. Um, and they're also attracted to light. So this title is uh, Phototactic, and you guys might recognize those uh, light bulbs there. <laughs> it's good to recycle your work. Yeah, so they're actually in this print I'm working on now. Um, the idea of traction is definitely related to my, my relocation experiences. And in my case, being drawn to a, a much, much brighter light than I was at before. Uh, geography is another influential element in my work. Uh, Mauna Kea, if you guys don't know, is uh, the tallest mountain in the world from the base to the summit, and it's in my backyard. Um, I wanted to convey a sense of time and the idea of uh, celestial movement, okay? So I created this rotating base where I'm literally rotating and, and wiping ink and then printing and then wiping more ink and then printing more. Uh, it was a really fun interactive way. I did a whole series of these uh, prints like this. Uh, so Hawaiian culture and folklore also are influential in my current work. This is the Ohia tree. This is a little one. Um, so here's a little legend, a little story for you guys. Uh, the legend says that one day Pele, who's the goddess of the volcano, who I've met in person, <laughs> met a handsome warrior named Ohia, and she asked him to uh, marry her. And he's like, nah, I got a gal already. Her name's Lehua. And she wasn't real happy about that. Uh, she was furious, and so after he turned her proposal down, she turned him into a tree. Right. Lehua was heartbroken, because, you know, what was once her lover is now a tree. And um, so the gods decided it was an injustice to have Ohia so sad and separated from Lehua. Um, so they turned Lehua into a flower, and put it on the Ohia tree, so they could be together forever. <laughs> I love that story. That's great. I love it. But for me, the uh, Ohia tree, the flower looks like an uh, explosive lava eruption. And these things are so cool. You, you pluck it off the tree and it's supposed to rain, because you make them sad. You're not supposed to do that. But uh, I like to have it floating there. Um, it does look like that. And this is very accurate depiction. It looks like a little bushy sort of explosion of lava. Uh, and with the constant reminder uh, that you live on the world's most active volcano, uh, it's, you know, it's hard to not 
let those ideas creep into my mind and my art, uh, my art and my work. Ohia trees are also the first sign of, uh, of life on solidified lava. And they can do that because uh, they can hold their breath. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been uh, like near or seen a lava eruption, but there's a lot of steam and sulfur dioxide and poisonous stuff coming out of the ground. Uh, and the tree just, just like, nope, I'm gonna hold my breath. And then it, it survives. And then it, when it's okay, the wind blows a different direction. It's pretty remarkable. This is titled Roots and was completed in 2016. I don't know if you guys can see or not. There's actually a little clocks down there in the lava chambers there. And, uh, roots, and, and so I haven't done this since the big earthquake we had a couple of years ago, but you can go underground in these lava tubes, uh, which is where it's like a conduit underground where the, the channels of lava flow and then they end up somewhere else coming out of the ground and shooting in the sky. Um, but when they empty out, you have a big cave and you can walk to these caves and all the ohia roots are hanging down in there. And it's just like the coolest, weirdest thing you've ever seen in your life. It's, it's pretty, wow. <laughs> Uh, so a uh, little bit different angle here. So amidst you know making my own artwork and teaching and all the other administrative sort of things I do, uh, I took the reins on in 2014 as the Pacific States Biennial Director, and it's one of the reasons why I wanted to go there because that's if I'm going to be isolated, I need to be able to interact with other artists frequently, and so this this constantly brings in fresh artists as jurors and there's other things we do uh, for visiting arts program as well. Um, but I had the task of choosing a juror. Wow, this is a big national show that's been going at the time, it was like 35 years. I was in this show in 2010. Everybody knows about this show. It's a big show. Beautiful catalog they make and everything. Who am I gonna invite so I don't look like an idiot? that's going to attract a lot of entries into the show. I'm sitting there talking to my department chair, I'm flipping through my drawing book because I'm teaching drawing, and Willie Cole, in my drawing book, like, hey, I remember that guy. Yeah, he gave me an award. And I met him at SGC a couple years ago. He was looking for somebody, and I got his contact info so I could pass it on to the other board members. I had his phone number. It's like, I'll be right back. I just run in my office, and I call Willie Cole, cold call, just call him up on the phone. This is like a famous artist, right? I call him up, I'm like a nervous boy asking a girl out for the first time on the phone. I'm like, hey, uh, Willie Cole, hey, you remember me one time when we met at the SEC? Blah, 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 blah. He's like, yeah, I remember you. <sighs> really? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, how would you like to come to Hawaii and jury this show? Okay. <laughs> really? <laughs> Awesome! It's like I'd never been to Hawaii. I was so excited. I had to contain all of it. Um, so, yeah, it turns out he'd never been there. He was excited to come, make a piece, jury a show with us. Uh, so we did a project with him, uh, and I'll show you that here in a minute. But The bigger picture here is all these shows that we do, and we do uh, basically a show every semester is an invitational show or a student show or a Pacific States Biennial show. It's all kinds of different shows. Um, students are involved in the whole thing. All the curatorial aspects of producing the show. Um, now this PSBN has been running for, I think 2020 would be almost, I think it'd be 38 years. Um, and it provides students and everybody involved with uh, professional development. Uh, these guys, when they leave, they could open their own frame shop. I mean, we do so much framing because they send the work unframed because we want to incentivize the idea of, of entering. Because if you have to frame your work, create it, and ship it to Hawaii, like, that's too expensive. Just roll your print in a tube and send it. It'd be like eight bucks, maybe 10, unless you buy insurance. Mm -hmm. Nobody buys insurance. Uh, these students are working on the, the 2018 um, project with uh, Helen Frederick, who started Pyramid Atlantic long time ago. So she was our juror of 2018. And these guys are printing a Centra plate. I don't know if you guys have done that. It's a plastic, so it's like sign plastic that you can carve, you can emboss, you can treat it like an Italia or a relief. It's, it's quite an interesting thing. Each, she had three plates. Each piece took an hour and a half to print. And we had to make 40 of them. Yeah. <laughs> 
This arts print edition project started in 2010 as a means to document all the visiting artists that we have coming through and doing projects for this. So each portfolio contains 10 different artists and we make 20 prints from each artist. So we end up with an extra 10. Uh, so each artist, when the, the set is done, gets a portfolio back with nine other people in it, plus themselves, right? Um, and we have 10 extra portfolios that we can give to donors. Uh, I'm working with the Library of Congress right now for this portfolio, which has Willie Cole in it. Um, his piece is actually the one on the end there that uh, sort of looks like uh, ocean water and uh, plastic trash. That's actually um, all water bottles. Mm -hmm. He does, right now he's doing these large sculptures out of, uh, out of plastic water bottles. I'm talking like full-size cars made out of water bottles. It's, uh, giant people made out of water bottles. So. Um, so we finished the second version here. We're already on the third. So we're already on artist uh, uh, 20, oh no, 30. Yeah, so uh, we're moving along with this. So, uh, yeah, 23, I think, is the artist we're on now. It takes about five years to finish one of these portfolios. Um, and it seems like it took me five years to make the box for it. But I spent my entire summer making this box. Oh, it's a good box, damn it! <laughs> one of the reasons I came to UH was there was a lot more research in the sciences. Um, I mean, it, even though it's a teaching institution, um, I mean, we have really in-depth research in geology, geography, marine science, and even computer science is really big. Uh, and we have one of the best telescopes in the world on Mauna Kea. In 2016, I was invited to co-teach a class with UH Manoa uh, to teach a data visualization course that uh, would involve art students, marine science students, and computer science students. And again, I was like, yeah, why not? I'll, I can do it. <laughs> but you gotta buy me some stuff. So I had a list and that's, I was like, oh, this is a revenue stream. So um, I ended up getting a lot of uh, cool toys out of it. But um, the course was essentially applied data visualization course uh, with coral reef research from marine science. And students were organized into multidisciplinary teams. So one art student, one marine science, and one computer science student. And they had to come up with a way to visualize that marine science student's research. Okay, no small task, right? Sounds kind of easy, but it's like, uh, you guys ever put rocks in the little rock tumbler thing? Yeah, and it comes out nice and smooth. <laughs> when you put them all in the beginning, like, uh, 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 they'll fight each other and they're rubbing against and they're just fighting and in the end they all come out okay, uh, nice and polished. <laughs> That's kind of how it worked. Um, uh, this is the cyber canoe display, which is, uh, you can get a sense of the scale. Uh, we built a bunch of these. It's now the other ones are way bigger than this. Uh, imagine a bank of you know 80, 80 inch 3D televisions that wraps around on your periphery. Um, that's 3D. You can put the glasses on. Um, so it is a full on immersive experience when you're standing there, and it looks like it's all the way around you. Right? So this is the system that students could display their work on. So students ended up gravitating towards a game idea so to display the visual data. Um, and so they used Unreal and Unity 3D gaming engines. Those are the software that you use to make uh, PlayStation games and uh, Xbox games. And so they're learning it at the same time they're doing it. So um, the idea is to, to bring this research, which is like basically what you'd have in an Excel table or something, and visualize it. Because that's the problem with science, right? It's, it needs to get out there so people can see it. Um, and some of those guys, they don't know how to, to make it visual. Um, so hence the art, right? Um, so other aspect is to make it interactive. Rather than a poster presentation, you know, a game. Everybody likes games. So why not make it something you can play and learn at the same time? You don't even know you're learning. So we use an Xbox controller. And this project you see right here is the Roy Roundup. Uh, and you had to sp uh, throw these spears or harpoons at, at these uh, roy, invasive roy fish and kill them. You kill them. And when you kill them, the other fish, they start, uh, population goes up. And so you see that ratio happen in real time as you're doing it. So it's all based on, you know, the numbers they pull out of these different areas of the ocean. 
It was kind of cool, right? So there was uh, other games about how reefs are established and others about how um, different kinds of reefs out there. So you get to learn and I learned a lot about marine science and it, it kind of crept its way into my work. Again, you know, the more I'm involved in something, the more I think about it. And the more I think about it, the more it comes up. Um, so uh, it's interesting to see how that happens. And moving is one way to do that. Uh, this is one of my more recent Aquatent projects. Uh, I just did this in tw at the end of 2018, so a little over a year old, uh, making reference to corals and warmth. And for those of you who don't know, rising open ocean temperatures is the leading cause of a coral colony collapse. They just they can't handle the heat. Uh, and these ecosystems are literally the foundation for the ocean. You guys know what happens when you pull the foundation out of something, it, it, it crumbles, right? And so, and oceans are kind of a foundation for terrestrial life as well. So it's, a, it's important that we know about these things. And so it's sort of uh, an area of interest for me now and I'm exploring it, not just aesthetically, but also um, conceptually. Uh, my next collaborative project is now taking shape. I'm working with a colleague in marine science um, to 3D print a large scale coral structure uh, based on corals that were actually 3D scanned. Have you guys ever seen 3D scanning before? Yeah, some of you. Uh, if you, I, I could 3D scan all you guys. If I walk around you and take three or four hundred pictures and upload it into a program, and then it would create a 3D model of all you guys sitting there. Uh, it's pretty amazing technology, um, but they're doing it underwater to track what's happening to corals. Um, and so I have some 3D models of coral, and I decided this coral scan was done through a process called photogrammetry. Um, again, hundreds of images were taken of this. This was. A uh, Hawaiian cauliflower coral taken off uh, one of the, the coasts of Hawaii. And so I have this model, yet it's this big. Okay? You guys know if you try to increase the resolution of a picture on the computer, it looks really janky and terrible. So I have the task of making this now 500% larger. Okay? And making it where I can 3D print it. My 3D printer can print something this big. Okay? But I want to make it this big. So, here's what I did. I took a quarter of the coral, okay? Because if I made the whole thing, it was gonna be 18 feet long. It's like, I don't even have a place to put that. So, I took and I, I sawed the thing into a quarter, and then I was like, okay, I gotta uh, engineer each piece. Um, there I am with the engineering again. Circle back around. Engineering each piece so that it, A, can be 3D printed, uh, and B, uh, will be structurally sound, once I put everything together, and I still have no idea how I'm going to put this together. <laughs> but I'm already uh, a third of the way through the project. It's going to take at least uh, um, two to three years to finish it. I'm in the second year. Um, so it's, yeah, 500% bigger than it was before. Uh, assembled is going to be uh, 200 cubic feet in size. Uh, and that's just pretty darn big. Um, so again, it's, uh, oh, I have a video for you guys. You can, you can see 3D printing if you haven't seen it. There's no sound, but the sound isn't really that interesting. So this is my, my new toy, and it's making a print. This is my first attempt. I've already tried three times to print this part. It's really sort of long, and it keeps falling over. So It's actually printing right now, as we speak. I'm controlling the printing from here. Uh, so just to give you guys a sense of scale, this is about a sixth of the model. It's not even fully assembled in the picture. I'm hoping this piece will be a catalyst for a much larger sculpture, uh, like maybe 30 feet, okay? Um, so, uh, I do want to thank you guys for your time. Um, I brought the project I'm working on here, and I think everybody got a chance to see that. Also, the model prints I made for my residency in Kauai. So, thank you guys so much. Um, if you have any questions afterwards, we can just hang out and you can ask me whatever you want. <laughs>